So now we're going to pass over to Scott. Is Scott McCauley on the call? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, here. I'm here. Thank you. Scott, hello. Good evening. Uh, evening uh, from Scotland, everyone. <laughs> good evening, indeed. I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop Scott's bio into the chat. I'll, I'll hand over to Martin now so that he can just give a brief intro to Scott's Petra future. Thank you, Anna. Scott, I'm, I'm so grateful you can join us th th this evening because I know you're rushing off to yet another session. Um, so I, I won't hold you too long. And I think most people in Zoom Returners have, have, have met Scott virtually. Um, and I've had the pleasure to, to, to meet you up in Glasgow in some of the specified sessions that we did. And we plans to do Living Building Challenge with the AS and all, all sorts of things going forward. Um, and I should also congratulate you and let everybody know, because I, I'm not sure if you will or not, of your um, recent article in Time magazine. So brilliant on that. Well done. I will have to so, concede. I didn't write it. I just got quoted and they used me to introduce it, which I was more surprised at by anything else. Yeah, but by getting your getting your name there is yeah that, that, that that's good that's very good. Okay, so Scott, do you want to share your screen? You you have six minutes forty seconds or thereabouts. Yeah, I've I've practiced a few times. Just just hopefully I can get this bang on. I was six minutes thirty nine seconds last time. So okay. right. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just start. So thank you very much for having me as part of such an interesting, fascinating conference. So the work that I do is on cultivating climate literacy in architecture and construction generally. And the kind of different tact I took at start was it began as a protest and it developed very organically from there because architecture doesn't have a stock response for the theatrical. So just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I, um, I coordinate in Probson Architecture School and teach climate literacy, but I um, also coordinate carbon literacy for the Architects Climate Action Network and I do quite a lot of natural building. So I like to learn from, I learned out with university when I felt that was lacking. So the Improvs and Architecture School is an agile architectural education platform. And before COVID, it used to momentarily occupy spaces and create opportunities to learn and respond to the climate emergency for construction, typically kind of cultivating climate literacies or creating opportunities to talk and to discuss different matters as well. Uh, this is really the kind of the re research that drew it together. So before I graduated, I couldn't really do many protests when I was in Canada on exchange. So I did a survey. So I kind of got the average understanding of the architecture student in 2019 of sustainability in the built environment. And this went into the Architect Climate Action Network's climate curriculum camp campaign and was published in parts of Everything Must Change as well recently too. And it sort of picked up a little bit more than I expected. So just last week, I did my 20th lecture at the 15th different university because climate literacy is really being picked up on to be something really significant in architecture. So we're starting to get a little bit of movement, which is quite promising as well. And at the same time, as Naomi Klein put really quite fascinatingly as well, is that we're alive at the last possible moment where we could change, save lives on an unimaginable scale, but that could also be an unimaginable scale of regenerative change. So you can look at that in two very different spaces as well. And this is the point that's important. I use this graph every single time. And it's because 39% of all carbon emissions on earth come from construction and buildings in some way, shape or form. So everyone who's teaching, who's practicing, who's working in buildings in any way, shape or form, can have a really positive impact on that anything that's not blue in this graph here as well. And I talk about climate literacy and not just carbon because it's about so much more than just counting figures and facts. So this is the kind of world systems model because it's more of a kind of foundational knowledge and a holistic mindset. It's not just a tick box exercise that we can attack on as kind of sustainability. It's a little bit more than that as well. Oh, that's frozen slightly because we've seen this a few times today as well. So kind of climate literacy is what's going to help us get from the left hand side of this graph to the right hand side by preparing designers and helping legislators understand why this is so much more than just driving down energy demand and driving down carbon emissions as well. Because even though we've got there is 28% of carbon emissions are from buildings operation, less than 3% of discussions even mention them. So there's a huge communications gap at the moment between what the positive potential we could be having in the built environment and what's really going through into kind of lots of discussions around the climate movement as a whole. 
And this kind of is a really quite standout piece. So 64% of people in the UK, even when we had, a, just before we had a net zero target, had never heard of what net zero was. So 87% of people in the UK have little to no idea how big a change positively that could make to their lives when we hit that target as well. So the kind of very first kind of climate literacy workshop I did was in a practice uh, for collective architecture. And this was really contextualizing what the climate emergency actually is in practice, what, what's doing, what's happening, and kind of signposting them to solutions and strategies and resources. And this led on into work that I've been doing recently, which was digitizing that and making that online. So since COVID locked things down, I've been doing hour long kind of hyper distilled sessions or even two hour long ones of discussions that again, contextualize the climate emergency and go through what can be done, tell stories of things that have been done well and give people things they can work with immediately afterwards. Another thing I've done is take social media and use it as a library. So there's no need for a building. And this is using, uh, just taking resources that can be accessed and explaining where you people can look for different things. Because practitioners are always asking, where can I learn about this one key specific thing? So my response was to just simply make something they could access quite easily as well from their phone. And that built into a bigger kind of now crash tested climate literacy starter kit, which is an open source paywall free curation of resources that really grounds architecture in the climate emergency and talks about identifying what we can do and we're responding imaginatively. So not just doing it kind of as we have done before. And one of my favorite quotes is from Rob Hopkins latest book. And it's because one of the like, fundamental challenges is imagining what's possible and not just the utopia where everything is green and there's trees on top of everything, but when things turn out okay and actually go really well. And that's a, it's a great thing to create spaces for with practitioners and students as well. Because the great thing is there's so many good stories that are happening right now as well. So the SBP awards brought together loads of these, so there's the regenerative, there was a building sustainability podcast, there's Agile Homes. There are so many people doing great things that we can learn from and be energized by as well and complement with what we're doing. And this is an example of when I created a space for cross-pollination between activists, architects, engineers, and NGOs in Edinburgh. So created a space that was outside of our kind of traditional silos to try and troubleshoot what was stopping their city from actually becoming climate emergency ready. And the responses we got were fantastic as well. It was so energizing to watch as well. And then another part of the Improper Architecture School has been using the existing press to make maximum noise. So this is really using pre-existing platforms to reach people that are inaccessible and to get this kind of messaging out as far and as fast as humanly possible. Which then leads us to Martin's final point. So I unexpectedly ended up having something quoted in time, which was quite interesting. It was the Wizard of Oz moment when I realized that my education wasn't preparing me for a climate emergency and they didn't have the solutions. But the fantastic thing is climate literacy and climate education is so mainstream, it's in Time Magazine. And that's me at six minutes 40, exactly. I do apologize if I was a little bit fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's absolutely wonderful, Scott. M many, many thanks. Um, we, we won't really have time to discuss in between um, the various presentations, because we've got quite a few to get through. Yeah, and somebody else who needs to get away swiftly this evening is John Bridge. But uh, Scott, m many thanks. And we'll, we'll pick up um, some of the questions, I'm sure, in future Zoom Regeneratives and in those what I'm now calling the world famous chat. So John, John Bridge, are you with us? Hello. Uh, good evening. <laughs> so we, we, although uh, Scott's based up in Glasgow, I think the rest of the presentations now are based in the, the Northwest here in Lancashire. John, you, you're in Preston? Yep, Preston, born and bred. Ready to go with a regeneration project that we've been working on. <laughs> and just whilst, just whilst John's setting up, John and I shared a presentation to local council for possibly the next Living Building Challenges project in the region. A space to watch. So, John, all yours. Thank you. So, hello, everybody. So, my name's John Bridge. Um, some of you may have caught the uh, presentation I did a few weeks ago. Um, but we're a studio in Preston and we specialize in regeneration, residential and digital architecture. Um, we are presenting though now, I'm going to show you this project called the Tramrail Bridge in particular, um, as um, I think a, a, a 
you're talking about that. But just a little rundown. This is our team. Three plus five. Um, quite a youthful team. Um, raising out of uh, a lot of our students are from the local university. Our class of ourselves um, are very passionate around eco architecture. Um, we love and the new build eco homes that we're doing or you know virgin on passive house but a very english version of that i must say and this project was born out of a problem and that was that the old tram road bridge running through from south ribble to preston city council across our famous river ribble closed down um after a report that came out the council having 200 uh, faults on it structural faults it's a precast concrete trestle bridge and one day it just shut down and it caused uproar within the local community um, as, a, as a main free fire to commute into town. So back in the day, um, it's, it's a couple of hundred years old, this bridge, early 1800s. It used to be a timber bridge where trestles like that with a, an interesting engine uh, room on it too which um, it was intention was that it would take trams one day, but back in back then it used to just carry carts and uh, horses used to um, go through and across the, the river. And this um, had a bit of machinery in because it used to take up a, a, a hill and, you know, it used, the cable used to snap. There were, there were people that used to, uh, there was quite a lot of accidents. People, people died, unfortunately, bless them. And um, when they, um, rebuilt the bridge, this concrete bridge here, um, in the uh, in the 1940s, they en ended up unearthing quite a, a number of vehicles that had fallen into the river. So it's got its um, history. This is what it's like today, um, you know. So, so yeah, to, to come up with an idea for a new bridge, um, interestingly, it started with a bit of an April Fool's job that I did where I came up with a, a Bifrost uh, Nordic mythological bridge uh, saying that we'd, been, we'd won a commission by the council. Um, of course, we hadn't, but, well, hey, how could we um, design a bridge if we were to have a crack at it? Obviously, it's council um, owned and, you know, would go through all the usual procurement issues to get a project um, like that. So I just thought, well, you know, it'd be quite interesting. We've not done a bridge yet. We've done some interesting projects and buildings, but this would be a quite nice one. It's in my name after all. So I thought, you know, why not? Um, and then from there, took a very professional, realistic view. And we sounded out the team and came up with this. So this is our version of essentially a small uh, Preston version of um, what could be like a garden bridge. We the idea had stemmed through bringing the park across the water. Um, honing in um, the park life mentality and really making it a destination because, you know, rather than it just being a, a bridge that gets you from point A to B, this could be in its own right part of the park. You know, you could actually have a picnic on the bridge and, you know, take time to view the water. Um, we've got, you know, a lot of lovely uh, scenery around Avonham and Miller Park and to have an elevated view from here um, would be, be fab and you know we honestly thought to change the dynamic from a straight bridge to to getting some enhancement and uh, by using timber engineered timber and um, of course it works best um, in tension through curvature so we've got a few double curves going on there with the balustrade and the actual um, structure itself the, the modern day take on the trestle actually generated out of a bit of research we've been doing on furniture and I've created a brand called Machine and this was essentially a little bit of a prototype from that. Um, of course, the idea here is to, you know, take pleasure in crossing over the water, um, utilise strength and materiality as um, part of that concept and generally come up with a, a very unique way um, of building a bridge, cost effective, um, very sustainable and encouraging um, ecology and, you know, wildlife and, you know, fauna across the actual bridge. 
which there currently isn't at the moment. The, the idea of walking across this wants to be very entertaining. It wants to feel like you're fluid. You know, it wants to feel like you can go from point A to B, um, you know, and cross over the bridge um, with real entertainment factor. And of course, the trees that we could grow in there, uh, local species and plant life, you know, we've actually tested this with the landscape uh, consultants as well, and it, it would actually work very well. But a few moments, like we've got these ellipsoid cuts here that cut out, see the actual water underneath and really um, bring out the drama of that fast flowing water underneath the River Ribble. And it would be fantastic to have that view. Thank you. The idea uh, with the water is that we would, we would light up the bridge through water, um, actually through a hydroelectric power plant. And this would actually not only power up the bridge, but also the park too. And how lovely that would be for a safe passive place, as well as illumination of our listed parks. So just to finish a couple of nighttime views here, I'm a big um, lover of um, all things sci-fi, in particular Tron. And I think any fans out there could probably see maybe a little bit of 80s inspiration there. Um, here, the bridges, illuminated trestles and the actual curvature as well being enhanced through those LEDs. So there's a little bit of talk up there. Yeah, there's a link there that I might be able to send around. And um, that's us. I, I will indeed. Thank you very much. That was superb. It does need building that bridge. That's the second time I've seen that presentation and no more than ever it needs building. Um, I'd like to know, well, free up John and just say thank you very much and enjoy your evening. And Nushin, if you would now like to share your screen. So good, good evening, uh, ladies and gents. I'm very honoured to be presenting here at this um, at this event. Um, I have been fortunate to be part of the Zoom regenerative com community since last November, and I was asked to present about a regenerative project that I'm a part of. Um, although this isn't that kind of project, and while by no means this is a self-promoting talk, um, I'm going to speak about my campaign as a candidate standing for election for education vice president position with the Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologies uh, this September. Uh, CIAT is the professional body which, among other things, is the accrediting body for the architectural technology degree and master's programs in higher education and uh, at several establishments, including three overseas, Denmark, Spain and UAE. Standing as a candidate, my mission is to contribute to a deeper consideration for sustainability in AT education with CIAT. As I think the role of a professional body is critical in framing, driving, and aspiring the road to sustainability through education. I think in order to promote the AT discipline, we need to be genuinely engaged, articulate, and active practitioners of environmental and social justice and make meaningful differences to individuals' lives before we can aspire the next generation to follow and uh, choose, follow us and choose a career in built environment. I'm standing to promote early engagement and to push for investment in engagement, trusting and believing that this is when we can inspire young souls to choose to be technologists, to be technical problem solvers, and to be a visionary technical designer. AT discipline, very much like the rest of the industry, suffers from a lack of diversity. And my view is that we can only overcome this problem by working closely with other institutions, such as class of your own, um, you have heard from with Alison Watson earlier today. I often think the problem is what James Cars refers to to be a finite mind, um, finite game mentality. 
a myopic vision only permits a view so far ahead and one's aspiration will be accordingly. The strategy taken by industry for years uh, and its clients, of course, and more recently by education establishment seem to be managing the uncertainty through quick wins. We believe it, but we don't behave it like resident what well, what we we don't behave like residents of a round planet where literally what goes round comes round but not necessarily with the same merits we must work with the rules of science knowing that everything we do has an impact on changing the quality of our environment it is widely accepted that construction is one of the most resource carbon and waste intensive industries but our efforts do not extend enough to make up for industry's current impacts, let alone repaying any past environmental debts. We do not know near, we do, we do not do near enough to reduce the industry's waste. Um, and it is since we yet to look at and consider physical assets around us as material bank materials for which we have never paid a true environmental cost. And perhaps this is partly why we feel at ease to dispose of them. But worst of all, it is that we somehow manage to glamorize our careless creations. I think unless we pull our emotions, thoughts and acts together with an authentic intention to heal our environment, our solutions are only going to be the beginning of new, more complex problems. And this is why I think we need to retrofit built environment education in general to set the sustainability as the ultimate goal, not just an overarching principle or as a golden, silver or bronze token or as an added um, value activity. Circularity is the rule of our planet. I'm pretty sure that there is a little bit of a dinosaur in all of us. And I genuinely think there is a little bit of a truth in the joke of coming back as a toilet brush. We need to learn to measure these circularities better and apply what we learned regeneratively. An ecological worldview is yet to be acknowledged by a vast majority who control the world economy. It is our duty to educate our industry's current and future workforce about limits to growth and planetary boundaries to collectively drive an industry that works in harmony with our planet. We have had the blueprint for <coughs> at least six years. And yet, as a forward liberal and democratic society, we are just about to embark on opening the way to, to men and women of color and non-heterosexual to join us. We have a lot of work to do, I think. As an AT, technology is our second name and it will always be the way we see and solve a problem. Let's use this capability to understand our environment better and explore solution which resonates better with our natural context that we are intending to build in. We are part of a whole and we must resolve um, uh, we must free ourselves from the delusion of separation from the rest of the species. As Einstein put it, we must free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creation, creatures, and the whole of nature as in its all beauty. Oh, do you know, that was so beautiful and such a, a lovely note to finish on. Thank you. And and I think what I took away from that was, you know, it doesn't just end when we throw it in the skateboard, we throw it in the green bin or the grey bin. It actually does go somewhere else. And maybe that will give us pause to think whether we need something in the first place. Thank you for triggering that in me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Nishin. But feel free to pop your details in the chat box. I've put one link in, but there might be more. Thank you. And now I'm going to pass over to Anne, to Anne Banner. Anne, can you share your screen? I'm sharing my screen. I've got my video on. And now I just need to find the presentation. Super. 
So Anne's been busy today. This is Anne's third stint. Thank you. <laughs> Hard work, you know. Right. Well, there, can you see my presentation? Indeed. Thank Super you. Super duper. Afternoon, evening now. Uh, this is Madel Petra Kucha on a little live project that we undertook um, this year uh, in a COVID world uh, for the final year AT students. Um, and we followed the Living Building Challenge ethos uh, for this project. Um, we feel it's really important that um, any of the decisions that we make um, have such a big impact on the building's ecological impact. So thinking about sort of location, orientation, massing, form and things like that. And if we don't get that right, well, um, the story is almost over. Um, we were asked by Preston City Council to look at reusing uh, an old football uh, pavilion on Moor Park uh, in the centre of Preston. It had it was still going to be used as a football pavilion, but it was also going to be used uh, as a cycle store. There's an uh, active cycle group uh, involved there and they have uh, adapted and adaptable bikes for all people to use and they needed more space. However, the canvas that they gave us to start off with had uh, not a great deal going for it. Uh, a building that had evolved over a number of years, there still is the uh, inside the Victorian sort of part of it. Various extensions had been added onto it. It had been painted brown by, by someone in the vain hope that it would uh, disguise itself. Uh, windows had been blocked up, floor levels were all over the place. Um, so not a not a thing of beauty, uh, but our starting point was that the building uh, was still sound and therefore why would you want to knock it down and start again? So our starting point was that approach that Nushan had just talked about, about sort of retrofitting. This was uh, a, a decent enough building and with a bit of uh, it could be brought into something that would be useful, adaptable and um, uh, valued by the community. Um, we did all the traditional things, went out and surveyed the building, tried to understand what the roofs were doing, what heatings were doing. Um, but we, before we sort of started putting pen to paper, we looked at the living building challenge, um, looked at the, the matrix and tried to get our head around what that meant for the building. The students that were working on it, though, took that and created this wheel. It was an analogy with the sort of the bike. Um, and just what um, Martin has just put in the chat, chat uh, really sort of rang here, that when you pull on one thing, you find it is connected to everything else, John Muir. And that's what the students very quickly realised that when they were talking about uh, materials, then that had a huge impact on place, on how what the kind of beauty of this building was. Um, when we thought about water, then that we had to consider the kinds of materials that we were going to uh, think about. Uh, so that realization that um, everything is tied together, and you can't just start off um, from some arbitrary point or some uh, concept or idea. You have to think about the building as a whole. Um, again, before we even started putting sort of pen to paper, we did spend a lot of time with the local community, talking to them about um, the building, what it meant to them, the history of it, what they wanted, how they imagined it being used, what was working, what was didn't didn't what wasn't working, because the council had come to us and said that one of the issues that they had was uh, vandalism, and we wanted to turn that on its head. That if actually we engage people in the design of the building, then they would learn to love it or uh, certainly like it, and that meant that they then felt felt that they had some ownership over the building. Um, we, all, we then started working. Um, again, we do things a little bit differently in the AT programme. Uh, we work collaboratively, so we don't work on individual projects. Uh, so, and that was um, that's how we've always done things. But in a COVID world, that was made slightly more difficult because we couldn't be in the studio. But we did use technology um, to help us. We set up share folders. Uh, we 
people who lived local to the site went out and did the site survey and things like that. Uh, there were people who couldn't uh, access the, the building or go out because of COVID. So they were tasked with doing the desktop studies and things like that. Um, we then started drawing. So I think we're sort of uh, slide six or seven. And finally, we're sort of beginning to put pen to paper to try and make sense of uh, what could be done to this building using the living building challenge as a sort of baseline but also taking on board the conversations we had had with the local community um, we did a quick SWOT analysis looking at the history of the building um, when we started thinking about the landscaping surrounding the building that's when we tied it in with the water understanding that we, we collected the water from the building that they could be used as swales and that might provide a bit of protection for the building. We also then thought about how we were going to use, um, ensure that the water was cleaned from the car parking spaces. Um, we took the roof off, that's one thing we did do, we took the roof off but replaced it with a green roof but that also gave us the ability to uh, bring light in into the centre of the building but also around the edge of the building so still dealing with the issue of security but also providing a light well in the centre uh, which allowed for cross ventilation that then tied in with the whole strategy of how we dealt with the water, how we dealt with the overhangs, which also had an advantage of shading the building, but also helped with the security of the building. We did a lot of research on um, how we deal with bikes because that was the whole thing. This was to be used by a group of people uh, who had limited mobility. They needed to be able to use the bikes uh, sensibly and things like that. And this is the little sketch that we ended up with, uh, a building that was going to be bathed in greenery with light uh, from light wells, uh, dealing with all its own rainwater, not using any sort of new materials, uh, really thinking about the end user and how they would actually use the building, but also ensuring that the building was loved by the rest of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And it's wonderful to see the Living Building Challenge mentioned. That's very unusual. <laughs> so I, I don't think I picked up. What's the stage? Is it going for planning? Or what's uh, the, it's funding now. That's what they're funding. looking for. Yes, for, to see if they've got the funding for it. Brilliant. So we, we now move way across the country to someone sat next to Anne. Alice, <laughs> Alison. <laughs> they've heard Alison talk earlier about a class of your own. Um, I'm not sure what your title is or content is, but I know it's going to be good, always is. <laughs> well, Alison. you would ask, Martin, indeed. <laughs> Let me just, am I all switched on? You can hear me, brilliant. Right, I'm going to be unashamedly begging everybody who's on here, and certainly, um, you know, having heard from Scott and John, you've got to get involved in this. So I'm going to start my slideshow and let's just see where it goes. So there we go, the Centre for Our Planet, a chance to help children make STEAM cool, and that's science, technology, engineering, and art and maths for all those people who aren't familiar with STEAM. Um, I mentioned earlier, many teenagers really, really don't know what the science is. They strike on Fridays and they really, really want to save the planet, but they're really, really, the science goes over the head. So we were approached by a fantastic group of people in Glasgow. So again, Scott, hope you're still listening. This is one for you, absolutely. So I might be in Lancashire, but I'm up in Glasgow. And this group of people who've called themselves after the pandemic are actually building a park right next door to Kingston Bridge on the route to the SEC Centre where COP26 will be held in November this year. And they said, work with us. We want to do something for young people and the children, get them involved. So we decided to design the COP. But the COP this time will be the Education Centre for Our Planet. And the whole idea of the Centre for Our Planet is that we can actually design it to make a science centre for children. But through peer learning, the children teach each other in a way that they want to learn. Again, democratising education, which I absolutely love. That to me is going to be my word, democracy this year. Um, the site itself is quite complex. It's right next to the Kingston Bridge, one of the busiest bridges in Europe. It's next to the River Clyde, Tidal River. If we don't make net zero, we are going to be in trouble. So the children are going to be thinking about flooding. And what's more to make it harder, we're going to contain them to a 30 by 30 metre area uh, that they've got to build their building in. They've got to think about what they're going to teach, why is this place so important, what activities will be delivered, and how can we make sure it's inclusive, it's absolutely beautifully designed to promote health and well-being, and it needs to be demountable, because actually on this site in three years' time, there's going to be a block of flats. So, and they're doing the digital plans, elevations, etc. Um, 
this is why we had to do something about it. I want everyone to go to Glasgow. Construction sites are dangerous. And if you live in somewhere like Stadman, where we are, how do you get to the COP? Because it's, it's 200 miles up the road. Uh, we can't just jump on a bus. It's time, it's energy, it's effort. It's, 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 not, it's a blocker. So this is what we're doing. And please, please, please let the technology work. Come on, come on, come on. This should be about two minutes. Um, and again, give me some heads up here. So we've actually surveyed, as a true surveyor in me, we got in touch with some friends up in Glasgow, said, please survey the site, scan the site. We're going to drop this into VR. We want to see uh, orientation, where's the sun highest in the sky. We want to get all that energy source. Here's the 30 by 30 meter plot that we want to be able to stake out so the children can actually measure the site and get a real sense of how much space they've got. We wanted to look at the, the surroundings. We're going to visualize this river. What happens if we, we, we go beyond the 1.5? Um, and, and there's the river. So this is all in VR for children and children anywhere in the world. People can get on site now in Glasgow and see what that area is. Um, they know where north, south, east and west is. And that's one thing we've found with children. They really, really do not know direction. Even if they pray, they still don't get how that builds into a site and, 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 and solar gain and so on and so forth. So if we're going to truly energize and engage and empower our children to be the ambassadors of our planet for the future and have a contribution to the COP, which is always for so long, been something for the grown-ups. We want to get everybody involved in designing the centre for our planet, the COP. Uh, we'll get surveyors involved because children have no special awareness in my, in my humble experience. A metre could be that big, never mind that big, as big as this room. Um, so again, stakeout tools are really, really necessary. All the surveyors, thank you to my lovely, lovely uh, pals at uh, Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering and Surveying. They're going to go onto site, go to schools, help them set this out, orientate it correctly. But children are doing this in VR. So I don't know how much time I've got, but I'm going to halt there with this. This is going live for all children. We need you to get inside a school and bring this thing to life. Because one thing about going to Glasgow, the friendliest place on earth, we need you to be friendly too. So what I'd like you to do is please, 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 please get involved wherever you are in the world. And to my friends across Europe and the friends who are online tonight, help go into your local school. You can visit our web page. It's free. There's loads and loads and loads of resources that we're going to give to children, help them understand some of the things around flood risk and mitigation and so on and so forth. Do get involved. Do contact us. That's it from me. Was that OK? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alison. Yeah. So it's something we can all get involved in Absolutely. and support. Yeah. And I think we should make that a Zoom regenerative um, supported mission for the year because oh, COP26 pops up every time and we, we can cycle to Glasgow there is a cycle to Glasgow um, event taking place um, and people are being put up in villages and towns en route and giving presentations around climate change during the evenings Phenomenal. So that's, that's well we need we to do. weave that in for the children Martin if we can we, we can't I mean you could host something you, could, you could host a cyclist yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. OK. Um, we talked about going to Glasgow. We're just going to pop over the hill now. Um, once across, again, across the Pendle Hill and down into Clear the Road. So, Richard, um, just looking around the grid, see if I can find you. Richard Stevenson. Yep. And uh, recognise the hat. Yeah. I'm without the hat tonight. I'm inside. Yeah. Um, great. OK. So Richard, if you want to share your share your screen, and thanks for um, agreeing to uh, share some more insights from your work. We had a conversation tail end of last week. You were talking about your 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 home. So looking forward. Excellent. Okay. So um, next to my home on the river, just down from the project that we were talking there, etc. I um, decided to take on a bit of a project, okay? So we created this thing, uh, this building, which is now called Otis Rest. Um, it was at the junction of two rivers. There's something magical about when two rivers come together. And so we have the river coming from the dam, at, which is now the Primrose Nature Reserve, and the other one, beautifully nice, clean river coming off Pendle Hill through Pendleton. But the two joined, and next to this industrial land, very contaminated, um, full of mill waste. I seem to be attracted to this stuff. 
and um, and what the idea was to create something that was sort of zero carbon as much as we could architecture. And I thought, well, we'll have a crack at it. So this is what it looked like. Okay, so this used to be underneath there was a, an old turbine, even the workings of the old turbine, uh, one of the very first turbines in the country, electrical turbines. Um, and above it, they built this sort of brick shelter just at the end of the turn of the century, single screen, skin falling down, completely derelict, uh, contaminated land in that section. I bought the bit of land and the building and everything else for only about 5,000 pounds because it was all about cleanup. And in the bottom, they used it as a settling tank. So all of the waste fibers were in there about three foot thick that needed clearing out in this tank that sat underneath that building. So anyway, we converted it. And this is Otter's Rest, okay, as it now looks, okay. Um, and one of the things we did was we say, we were sitting on this amazing river where these two rivers coming together. And um, so what we did was extend the balcony out. And because we're in Lancashire and we get stuff called rain, all right, then I took the roof line out so that in fact, we then support it on those buildings. Now, everything that you see here, most of it is all recycled. We found these beams from inside the building and, um, and we built this deck outside and the verticals of the deck are all from the building. And the uh, rail you say is, is there is a coir. One of the rules was no hardwood allowed in the building, you know, have to be all um, sustainable, although I'm told tonight we're not allowed to use sustainable. Um, uh, but anyway, it, um, that was what we were doing. And in the front, we also cut back the building to create the sort of lodger, um, again, where you could sit and then look at the outside. Again, those beams we found in the building rotting at the back, we all cleaned them up. And even the floorboards there, um, they look really nice, but actually they're scaffolding boards, old scaffolding boards, sanded and then stained. And generally speaking, we're trying to recycle everything we're doing. And the um, uh, interior is interesting. I decided to have a crack at it because if you own the thing, you can afford to take risks, all right? I decided that um, we clearly had a position on the river. Um, it's gonna be a lot of humidity. So I thought we designed the wall system so that in fact, we were it was sort of hygroscopic and, pour, and pulling the air, the, the moisture out. So we, out of that brick skin, at the bottom, we put a ventilation things that I then put one at the top, created a, a cavity to try and get this convection current going, membrane, a whole bunch of hemp here, 200 millimeters of hemp, wood will board, and then lime plaster, which is often put on the outside of the building, on the inside, and unfinished, it's not painted, it's just as it is. And that basically is pulling the moisture this way, that's the thing. Actually, um, it works really nicely, and I put a thermal imaging camera on that, and then basically you can see it actually working. So it's really quite interesting. That was a lot of fun. It feels really good inside the building, and also using recycled floorboards from the mill next door, um, all in, randomly placed here, um, all with gaps in it, fly screen behind it, and um, and I'll talk about some of that in a minute. Um, ceiling, of course, all hard surfaces. You know, echo. We need to have this nice ambiance in there. So. In the ceiling, we've got um, 10 mil gaps in the ceiling. I've used um, straightforward softwood, but given it a sort of white wash to it. Um, and uh, behind that is a fly screen, and then there's hemp behind it as well. So we're putting a lot of hemp there. So the, the sound is going through those little gaps, getting absorbed by the hemp, and actually gets a nice feel, even though it's hard surfaces. And above that, there's PIR insulation to get us the light insulation standard and then membranes, and then we reuse the slate that we had beforehand. And all these beams were original. These were just sandblasted and cleaned up. So it was possible to do it. And then we have this, uh, um, we decided to, we have this sort of lean-to bathroom, which you step down into. And all of this uh, paneling is all from uh, boarding that we cleaned up. And it's all pitch pine. It's beautiful color to it. That's a natural color. And instead of having windows in the side of the bathroom, we. So I'd just open up the roof. And so, you know, you have, you can be in there and you can see the moon, the stars, and you've got all of the trees which are above you, which gives you a fantastic feel for it. Um, so everything's really, such, even this piece of slate here, for example, we went, to, <laughs> went up in the car and got it from Cumbria, you know, locally to here to make sure that we were using as much as we could. Um, this is all um, underfloor heating and, uh, and ventilation from this bathroom to a centralized heat exchanger. Uh, we talked about previous pre presentations about uh, rainwater harvesting. 
there's a nice big tank outside. All the gutter system goes into rainwater harvesting. Um, and then we have a filtration system using ceramic filters, which gives you the right thing. I must admit, I got the calculations wrong. We didn't have enough rain. <laughs> I'm not getting enough rain in there. So we do have a backup in case we ain't got up the mains pressure, but I would have loved to have got pure rainwater and certainly we would have got the quality, but, but I, I just didn't do the maths that some of these academic people sitting on this call can do. 30 uh, seconds, Richard. Sorry? 30 seconds. Right. 30 seconds. All the furniture is handmade, you know, and all recycled, upcycled beds. Uh, the heating is from uh, an SA, wood thing, et cetera, heat exchanger there. And that is it. And I'm sort of pretty well um, 20 seconds uh, rather than 30 seconds. And, and thanks very much. But that's our little project. And it's, uh, it's a really nice place. Thank you. Richard, that was just absolutely beautiful. And um, you had me at, at reconditioned scaffold boards. And then I saw the, the slate, the, the slate work in the bathroom and, and the sink, absolutely beautiful. And, and just again, truth to materials, local materials, reuse, repurpose, yeah. re-love. Um, thank you very much for sharing. All right, my pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's super. We're now going to move to John Rennick. And um, back to John. John, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just about to try sharing my screen. I've still got the Otter's Rest on my screen, but... So John's going to bring together some of the threads that we were talking about earlier in the day about Vastu and meditation and the and Vedic science and incorporating some of that throughout this. Great, well thanks very much um, again um, Martin and Anna for, for this opportunity to present this building that uh, I was working on 20 years ago in Lancashire. I live in Suffolk now but uh, sort of heart and mind very much still in Lancashire I'm afraid and um, because I'm dealing with two topics, the um, design of the building and the materials, um, very kindly they've let me have two, I don't know how you used to, what the plural of peta kutcher is, peta's kutchers. Anyway, I think I might have a bit longer, but I'll, I'll still try and be as quick as possible because I know there's quite a few more people still. So the building then is the Woodley Park Centre, which is a community project and facility for sports and arts for the Morrissey School in Scalmersdale. And um, that's a picture of the school at the moment. It's, it's, a, it's now um, a free school and there's about 100 children there. It's very popular and it's about to, it's expanded since 20 years ago, but I'll come to that. Um, so I chose this as a case study for Vasco Architecture and also uh, Round Earth because um, I felt that it was, you know, it's, it's, it's a modest building, it's only about 300 square metres, um, but it's a community centre, it, invol it, it involved a lot of people, you know, a lot of um, uh, people in different shapes and sizes contributed in some of the ways that have been discussed at the excellent presentations earlier on this evening. And um, I thought it was a good, a, a good example. It's the first Vastu building of this type in the UK that I know of, and um, it's, it uses rammed earth. So um, what's the main idea of, of Vastu? Well, the, it, the, the main concept, it, this is an ancient system. Um, I gave a talk on it two months ago uh, for Zoom Regenerative, so I'm just going to sort of compact it this evening. But the central idea is to connect people to the their, themselves by connecting to the cosmic structure, if you like. Now, what does what exactly does that mean? Well, we are cosmic individuals already. You know, we're connected to the sun. There's studies on uh, how we're connected to the moon and so on. It's not esoteric. It's very out there. Why don't we have our buildings so that they facilitate this connection? And you know, the incentive is health and well-being. And um, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who I talked about earlier, is the founder of Transcendental Meditation. Um, he very much focused on this other avenue of Vedic science called um, Stapatya Veda or Vastu. And he met Stapati, so Indian families, proponents for generations of this knowledge. And um, there are many texts about it. It's nothing new. It's been there. It's around the world. But he was particularly interested on, in the 
practical value, but also in the concept. And he described it as building an individual structure which is completely aligned to the eternal stability of the cosmic structure. Very loaded words, eternal stability. How can you have a house or a, a building which somehow reflects this cosmic structure? One of the pre presentations just now talked about the value of children understanding sun, you know, where the sun is and so on. They know very little about it. But why can't we all have buildings where um, the sun is taken into account in the design? A lot of a lot of the big builders, they've got a house type, they'll have it facing any direction. And um, it really doesn't have anything to say about the outside, just the inside of the building. So Vastu is a, is, a, is a way to address that. There are many issues. How do you actually do it? You know, how do you, what do you actually do? Well, there are many issues. There's, um, you know, th there's basically placement of rooms according to the position of the sun, dimensions according to uh, the, the anthropomorphic dimensions of the, originally the owner of the building and so on, proportions and so on. But a big area is um, orientation. And again, we discussed this a minute ago. There's been um, quite a lot of research now showing that the brain functions differently according to which, not just the human brain, but animal brains as well, according to which direction they're facing. And um, it's not just that the functioning of the brain is affected by orientation, but the houses that we're in are going to also function differently according to which way they're facing. Now, this is an interesting idea to get your mind around. So in, in designing this building then, we were thinking about orientation. And traditionally in, in Vastu, buildings face east, the direction of the rising sun, um, you know, east-ish, northeast in the summer, southeast in the in the winter and so on, but east in general, you can have north entrances. So you orientate your building in, in that particular way with the entrances in, in that way. So moving on quickly, round earth, why did we choose round, round earth? And this was in the 19, late 1990s. Uh, people weren't thinking that mu as much about climate change as they are now. Some people were, but most weren't. And uh, we wanted a radical material which said something about connection to the planet. You know, we're of course, talking connection to the cosmos, connection to the planet as well through the material, cosmos through the design. So um, we employed this guy, Roland Keeble, who's uh, a consultant in Round Earth. He's done a lot of Round Earth buildings in Africa. With his father, he wrote this book. And I'll come back to it in a, in a few minutes. But at the time that we were doing our he was diverted to doing the Eden project, which is this lower, uh, the photograph down there, the round earth wall, anyone who's been to the Eden project will know, well, that was built at the same time as our building. And I had difficulty sort of um, getting him to come back to finish our building with me. The book quotes round earth as a beautiful, durable building material with long and successful tradition of use in the UK and around the world. But round earth is also enjoying a revival, just as vast is. Earth construction is, as you know, a low impact material with so many advantages. It's stru you know, structural, it's airtight, it's high thermal mass, it deals with VOCs, it's hydroscopic, it's acoustic, it even um, defies electromagnetism, it absorbs that. And uh, of course, it's the whole building is recyclable. You can knock it down, the rammed earth or cob or whatever, and use that material again, you know, without doing very much to it. But because our earth is everywhere, we, we need to make use of it. And the contender is concrete. And uh, Anna sent me an excellent TV program recent about the threat of concrete. Cement is just unbelievable. The global addiction to cement, you know, is such an issue and as a, as a civilization we've been doing cement that's what we do and uh, now it's so 20th century and we need to it's fantastic to hear about one of the earlier buildings that built without any concrete at all we didn't manage to do that but we majored on on round earth so we combined the two because we're interested in design and we're interested in materials we wanted not just to have be thinking about climate change from the point of view of design, we want, uh, our materials we wanted to be thinking about people 
and how we um, are better at what we do and how we health and well-being and all these issues from the point of view of design. So you bring the two things together. Now, um, the site was um, uh, the planners wanted us to have a very large car park for another building that we built a few years previously. So the, the land was there, it's part of the new town, it's right next to the car park that we could use, and it's suitable for a north, north south east west um, facing building. Um, we were collaborative. We like to involve not just the people in the community but unbelievably the chairman of the council, chairman of planning, the local councillors, uh, but even the bank manager, the QS, the estate agent, you know, a range of people. This was for starting the second part of the site, where, which the major part of it was the, um, the Woodley Park Centre. The only person who was practical on this team was uh, the site manager, who's the only one wearing a helmet. This was the 1990s, but, um, you know, we, we went on to carry on collaborating all these people. And um, we put up the structure first, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. It's um, a steel frame building, as I say, 300 square metres, a footprint about 250, and um, it's got a timber, glue lamp timber roof. And, um, oops. And um, the, 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 we needed the whole thing up before we could do the round earth. Why is that? Well, there are two issues with round earth. There's weather during construction and there's what I call weather forever. <laughs> this is the northwest of England. You have to think about the weather as one or two other people have pointed out. So with um, rammed earth, crucially, rain alters the moisture content of the earth mix, which is a disaster. So you can't have rain falling directly on, you know, and like building a concrete block wall or whatever, you've got to shelter it. And the way we do that is by, um, uh, uh, we basically design, with this building, we design high level windows to allow sheltered access to the ramming of the walls. We'll see that in a minute. And then we also built the roof before starting the walls. That's the key thing. So you could get to the walls, but you could get to it without the rain. And then in terms of the weather forever, well, the durability of the building round earth is vulnerable. So as uh, you know, again, with splash from the rainfall from the um, uh, falling on the hard standing next to the building, but also, uh, you know, sideways rain that you get uh, falling onto the round earth. So the solution for that is very much like cob, uh, a good hat and a good pair of boots. So you have a bit bigger than usual eaves overhang and you have um, uh, uh, masonry plinth, um, which is half a metre or so high, so you avoid the splash. So here's our roof up with the, um, uh, the, the inside finished and the tiles on and everything uh, ready for the rammed earth. And um, here is the ramming. Uh, basically, we would mix, um, where am I on my thing? So we would mix, um, we'd have a paddle mixer, we'd mix the earth, the um, sand and the water together is amazing because we had um, we had companies donate because it was a school they donated uh, the earth you know the the clay because the clay on the site wasn't suitable we actually got coal on the site being scum as the um, surface coal um, and uh, another company donated the sand so we had a lot of kind of we had some very good fundraising efforts people put put in stuff donated the roof tiles and so on um, so the ramming took place, we would do formwork between two adjacent columns and we'd move up that formwork as we rammed and then uh, the whole ramming of one three metre wide panel would take about a day with usually four people, a team of four. So um, we, as I say, we used a, pan, a paddle mixer and a, uh, a handheld sand rammer. 
Um, we had uh, every now and then at the weekend, I would involve the community. That's my son, actually, who's now 27, <laughs> who was, um, people would help. They, they would really get into the round earth. It wasn't done very professionally, but by then we knew what we we're doing and we could accommodate, um, you know, people doing different things. So it's very enjoyable. So this, these are the earth walls on the inside then, shortly after the formwork's been taken away. Um, because it was a sports centre, we didn't have to think about insulation very much. Um, that's now come up again, but we'll come to that later. Um, so you can remove formwork immediately after ramming. And that's the north wall. Now, the north wall of the building is actually pretty much the, the, the formwork, the um, rammed earth is as we as it was when we took the formwork away. It's just incredibly durable. The south, because it takes sun and, and rain, needed a lot of needed rendering. So um, this is the finished building now on the inside with the beautiful wooden floor, which is also donated with blue lamb beams and the lime rendered internal um, uh, walls for the, uh, the external walls, lime rendered on the inside for the round earth. And, you know, we used it for um, exhibitions and events as well as the school use. So here's an event, you know, we'd have lots of local people, we'd have attic sales and, uh, you know, various things, we'd have meals and so on. Uh, it's very, very popular community centre. People would walk in and they would just see, the, they would see the roof and they would see the round earth walls and they think, wow, yeah, this is, this is quite special. And being a Vastu um, um, consultant, I always like to think they walked in and got the vibe of the building, but I think often it was materials as well. <laughs> so, or both, you know, holistic. 40 seconds, John. Okay, I've nearly finished. So oh, um, Roland Keeble went on to include pictures. He brought a new version of his book out. These are, these are three outcomes now at the end. Um, new version of his book with pictures of our building in and descriptions and so on. We also got um, an, a Bureau Award, Best Practice in Urban Regeneration, which was um, tri triggered by the Round Earth Building, but looked at our other buildings and our school project and other successes in the area. And um, finally, about 10 years ago, that was all happening 22 years ago, 10 years ago, the government um, converted the paid to convert the building into the free school building. So it, it went from being a sports and arts centre into a building for um, the secondary school, 120 children. Um, I'm afraid you can see a lot of PIR here and different materials that I wouldn't have used, but they spent more money on the conversion than we spent on the original building. And the building has gone on to do, sport, carried on doing sports and arts, but also doing the main, uh, the main activity, which is a secondary school. And um, it's gone from success to success. I'm, I've been asked this afternoon to look at doing an extension here on the left because they've got such a long, long waiting list to be in the uh, for children to come to the school and they want two more classrooms. So I think it, it's it's a bit out of date now, 20 years, you know, it's not so much up to date with all the thinking that we've got now on climate change, but it was pushing the boat out for these two issues materials and design, which are key to a lot of our new buildings. John, so, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. And you've crammed it all in. There we go. There we've, we've got your email as well. Fantastic. Um, I'll okay. pop that in the chat box afterwards. Brilliant. OK, sorry to go on for so long. <laughs> not at all, not at all. We've, we've just been sat here just soaking it all up. It's absolutely okay. fabulous. And I don't think it's out of date at all. Um, okay. We're going to move over now to a new member of the group called Richard Shears. Are you comfortable sharing your screen with us? You've got so much to share about the... So Richard, for the benefit of the group, Richard's going to talk about wetlands, mangroves, salt marshes, Landscape scale climate adaptation. That's the one. That's wonderful. So over to you, Richard. You've got okay, so 13 minutes. We can all hear you, we can see you. You've got 13 minutes. I'll, Go try. I'll try my best. I'm going to gallop through this. There's, it's available on PDF, so people can pick up stuff if I, if I, if I go past a lot of things. Talking Thanks. about um, definition around sustainability and stuff, the 
definition I always uh, refer to is the one, uh, there's two documents that informed the Rio summit. One was uh, the Brundtland report and the other one was caring for the earth. So it's the caring for the earth definition, which basically is living within the carrying capacity of supporting ecosystems. Okay, so uh, I did this uh, slide uh, it's about six, seven months ago because I was getting a bit fed up with uh, the terminology around green infrastructure. It means different things to different people. And so I put this as a, in a schematic looking at the planning hierarchy and the characterization of a green infrastructure policy at different spatial scales there. So um, the uh, landscape is, needs to be managed uh, and it needs to be have a sort of an, an ecological approach to that. And how we do that uh, depends upon our analysis around uh, its uh, ecology, the ecological networking particularly. And in urban areas, we need to really get that ecological connectivity into the urban areas. So uh, I'll push on. Um, I'm gonna talk about, the first part is gonna be about coastal. And this is just, uh, uh, the graph of sea level rise. So about just over 6,000 years ago, we were re really fortunate in that the, the sea level plateaued out. And this is really what uh, really stimulated the growth in human settlements around, around the coast. But we've uh, squandered quite a bit of that. And we'll have to see how the situation pans out. But so the advantage around the coast are those on the left-hand side there, uh, of course, basically it comes down to the, the uh, proximity and the richness of the ecosystem services and the wetland and the uh, marine resources, the fertile soils and so on. And but particularly in the last 100 years, we've had these really severe human impacts around the urbanization, uh, around uh, pollution of water and soil and uh, land substance because of excessive abstraction, uh, degraded bi biodiversity, et cetera. And of course with climate change, you're gonna get um, really uh, the ramping up of uh, storm intensities and the hurricanes and flooding and of course sea level rise. So we've got that to contend with. Uh, and that's a note there that we've got about half a million people um, living within the coastal zone. And this is just a, you can pick this up on the, on the PDF, but this shows you the, the distribution in, in relation to the coast uh, of the Earth's population and how important the coastal margins are. Uh, and again, uh, just in relation to sea level rise, and it's a, this is a slide really, which you think about it, this is the same part of the climate change narrative. It's the, the, it's the least, the people who are least responsible for the gross uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are the ones who are gonna really bear the brunt of this. So most of the, the large Delta areas around, around the world, they're really, their sedimentation is gonna keep up with sea level rise. And that's exacerbated because of damming uh, Etc. Um, but we are more fortunate in the UK in that we will be less impact, impacted on sea level. And I'll come to that in a second. So there's, there's 10 cities here which are really going to be severely in, impacted by about 2070 or uh, the back end of this century. Um, so, so sea level rise, it, it expresses itself differently depending on where the meltwater is coming from. If it's coming mainly from Greenland and it manifests strongly in the southern hemisphere, it's sort of counterintuitive, but you have to sort of, it's, it's about gravity really. And so once the West Antarctic ice sheet starts to melt, that starts to express itself more towards the Northern Hemisphere. So when we get a combination of what's gonna actually happen, you can see that the UK will be less impacted than a lot of other coastal areas around the planet. So we're pretty privileged in many ways and we should be making more progress than we are. So key natural climate change solutions are salt marshes, seagrasses and mangroves around the world. Uh, and for the UK, salt marsh and seagrasses are particularly important. So this is, um, I mean, you've got carbon sequestration is, is, a, is a part of that. And that's the point I wanna also make is that if you have an ecological approach towards uh, climate adaptation, it's inherently got some sort of mitigation uh, to go with it. So that's just a map of the, um, uh, seagrasses and salt marsh and mangroves around around the globe. You can see the concentration of salt marshes uh, around the European coastlines. So this um, there's a great potential for adaptation, but the longer we hang about and don't really get on with it, the more expensive it is and the more impactful it's going to be. So I just thought to show you there, throw in there, slide there that um, 
there's a mangrove restoration project there in Indonesia that, that was done some years ago. Things are happening around the world. Um, but I wanted to show you this. So this is um, an example uh, from the Northwest. Again, this is showing the uh, salt marshes distribution in Western Europe. And we're gonna look at a site called Hesketh Outmarsh East. This is on the south bank of the Ribble Estuary. Uh, the estuary is uh, quite significant, very important for wildlife, but it's a much uh, degraded estuary, very channelized uh, because of Preston Docks. It was created in the, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, uh, Geomorphologically, it's uh, really been impacted. And the site that we're gonna look at is on the right-hand side there with that red line that goes around it. Uh, we, the idea of the scheme was to push back the coastal defense, which had been extended initially in 1980, that the one that's nearest to the River Ribble. And we would push back the, that defense line and breach the one nearest the Ribble. And that's uh, uh, easier said than done. Uh, the benefits of this scheme in black, the big economic benefits and the more sort of ecological ones are in green. But that's why I wanted to point out there that the, the, the fact that you're creating this salt marsh is actually part of the flood defense system because that saps the energy out of any incoming storms or rising tides. And it serves to actually make the actual flood bank that you're creating more resilient. So it's nature working for you and you're working with nature here. So a lot of those ones in green there are factors, are measures that are sort of driven by uh, the European Water Framework Directive, which we don't necessarily have to comply as much with now. On the left-hand side of this slide here is a report from Natural England indicating the sort of climate change vulnerability across the landscape of the Northwest here. And then on the right-hand side is from a piece of work uh, did with a colleague a few years ago on ecological networks. And um, next door to Hesketh Outmarsh East was the site Hesketh Outmarsh West that we did in 2007. So you can see there one's dark green and the other's still white. And that's the, the importance of creating these big uh, habitat areas, which is what the, Law the Lawton report, Making Space for Nature, was really trying to get across. And the ecological connect connectivity is so, so important for climate change resilience. Uh, the quick slide there, uh, looking at the ecosystem services which uh, this uh, project will sort of deliver. So after about 30 or so years, this site that's been uh, uh, captured from the estuary with an outer bank there where those purple stars are, um, this is, it becomes a much degraded site. It's been reworked with farm. It's very low biodiversity. It's flattened, it's compacted. There's only, there's a diminishing, only a diminished rel relic creek system. So in order to restore that, there's a lot of work got to be put into that. And the, uh, Breaches have got to be carefully, carefully designed, but I'll, I'll come on to the sort of details around that. So basically for doing a, a managed realignment, you need to do fo focus on four things. And uh, this is part of um, an 80 slide presentation I give to students. So I'm really only skipping just very lightly on this, but it's basically really effective breach design, recreation of the potential, uh, potentially efficient creek system, detailed design of the micro topography and diversity of the landform, uh, which is particularly important for the biodiversity that's really going to be there, part of the regeneration. And also you need to think about uh, pre-breaching clearance of vegetation growth. Otherwise you get this sort of uh, um, matting layer, which really really is an inhib inhibitation for, for the regeneration. So, you, so those arrows there are pointing to areas where there's bits of uh, deposition going on from the excavation of the creeks. And you've got to think about that. That's that micro topography. And the lines there is showing the outer bank, which is going to get breached. You can see the sort of the indication of the geometry of the breach that's going to go in there. And we'll look at that in a second. So that's uh, it, an isometric sketch of the uh, standard geometry designed. And that's a sort of the construction process. So that's bridge one, uh, that's showing the geometry. You can see there, it's just about, it's done. That's prior to the next high tide coming in. This is bridge two, just down along, along from it. Uh, and that's the uh, geometry just about finished, just on the breaching process. And then the high tide coming in in the middle of September in 2017. Uh, this is um, the LIDAR, which is showing you the, uh, on the left, which is, the finished breach and then three or four months later you can see how nature has really got in there and really the the creek on the outer marsh next to the ribble which had completely uh reduced because it hadn't wasn't functioning 
once you've got that tidal exchange going through it, it really starts to erode out and nature is really reclaiming that space. And so this is showing you what it was in 2012 on the top picture and the bottom picture. That's the very first high tide that came into the site. And then three months later, you can see it's almost indistinguishable between the estuary and what used to be the farmland, what is, what is now the salt marsh, becoming the salt marsh. And that is, so uh, if you go, this is the finished version we, we had at the big start of September. But if you go on Google Maps, you can look how it's progressed since there. And uh, it's, that's quite uh, exciting really. And how the geometry of those breaches have done, it's everything's working quite, quite well. So there's a lot of drivers around that. Uh, for the planning, uh, terrific. Uh, maybe certainly some of the European stuff is, is, has just been fantastic, but I, I do worry where we're going now. Another another concern now on the coastal side, just to flag that up, is the coastal landfills. A lot of these are starting to seriously leak, and in areas where you've got managed realignment, really you need to be going forward with, with that. And in coastal erosion areas, again, there's got to be some serious attention. So we've got to be, do, be doing some work there. Now, on the shoreline management plan for the northwest, this, that goes stretches from the Orms Head up to Carlisle. This was um, finished in 2010. The aspiration was for 124 kilometers of managed realignment by 2030. And all we have got done are those two kilometers of Hesketh Outmarsh West. Okay, so that's the coastal erosion and managed realignment sort of talked about. I'm now gonna go on very quickly uh, this, uh, I'm about two thirds way through the presentation on the inland peri-urban and urban zones. Okay. We might just have a couple of minutes if that's okay, Richard. Okay, I'm sorry yeah. to curtail so, you. There's also the sort of the land use, and this is from the Tech and from uh, Central Alternative Technology Zero Carbon Britain. So you've got uh, the grassland and uh, food for livestock, how we change our diet, and also we need to get in there a lot more uh, land use for carbon capture. So this is just looking at, at the area bounded by North Liverpool, Formby, Southport and uh, uh, Ormskirk. And that shows a, a, a Fenland-like landscape, which is really highly cultivated. A lot of energy is put into that to get that out. You can see the drainage network there. And this relies on lowland peat, uh, which has been severely degraded. And these are just surveys from 55 to 85. I think we've got a loss in some places of about three meters from the landscape and this is a loss of natural capital and this is generating about a quarter of a million tons of carbon dioxide per annum uh, and then you've got the it also very energy intensive maintaining all the infrastructure and it's going to flood out and if you switched off the seven or so pumping stations on the right hand side you've got it what it was in the 1600s with a small mere this on the left hand side is what you would get now if you switched off those pumping stations but you can have Agriculture done more efficiently, and this is a quick shot of, a, of the situation in Northwest Amiens, which is a sustainable wetland uh, agriculture, which uh, quite traditional. And again, urban areas. This is pro, uh, a slide of the Porhert. I won't go into that, but it's been a really successful program over uh, the, the last couple of decades there. Um, just reminding you about that slide there. We're going to just go into the urban areas. Key for urban sustainability is quality of placemaking, of which green infrastructure is fundamental and urban, urban cultivation. Uh, it makes people want to have to stay in their place and to look after it and exercise stewardship, interact, and it all is all sort of additive, and that's what we need to be sort of thinking about. Just Richard, wanna, let, all right. okay, I might have to stop you there. Just, just let me just two more slides. So that's on the right hand side is an example what was only passed five weeks ago in planning in Swansea uh, of green infrastructure. This is what we did in Bolton. Uh, we proposed for the council. You see the difference between the two. That's very biophilic design. This is the sustainable urban drainage, which is still not being pushed enough in this country. This is an example of 30 hectares of uh, warehouse roof that could have been photovoltaics and generating 150 million kilowatt hours per annum, but isn't. Uh, this is how they do it in China, landscape scale stuff. So paradigm shift, and this is, the, this is the problem we have, is trying to get across the understanding and the envisioning best practice and, and really moving this forward. And I'll just finish at the bottom there, is that really what I've been talking about in a way is natural resource catchment management. But above there is a summary of what I've been trying to get at. So that is the presentation.
Richard, we're going to need to have another go at it. That was so, everybody, thank Brilliant. you for, Brilliant. yeah, absolutely. If, such a detailed presentation. I'll, I'll, we'll, you and I will catch up tomorrow and we'll share the slides to the audience. Um, I thought it was a good place to leave it at place making, and which was something that we've talked about all night. And then the, the rest of the slides were equally um, insightful. Thank you so much. Right, now I'm going to pass over to Martin. He is our bookend for the evening. No, <laughs> not in a Professor Yaffle kind of way for anyone for whom that resonates. Um, Martin's going to wrap up the evening now with his Petra Kucha. And then if we've got the stamina, we can all have a chat and a bit of a roundup for the evening. Thank you, Martin. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Well, what a wonderful evening. Absolutely fantastic. And I'd just like to bookend the, the evening, uh, or, or the day rather, with just a, a few thoughts as my petty future. And I've shared lots of content about regenerative stuff um, through Zoom Regeneratives. So I really want to focus on a bit of me. Um, so this is a personal regenerative journey, um, going way back to the 70s, 80s, right up to date to, to, to today. And a lot of people ask me, why have I called my business Fair Snape? Well, here is Fair Snape. It's a hill which I can see, not as close as this, but I can see from my home. So when I started my consultancy business 20 odd years ago, I was looking for a name which wasn't Martin Brown Consulting. I wanted something very, very different. Um, so I pinched the name of Fair Snape. And I spent a lot of time in the hills. I, I spent a lot of time walking. And in, in my youth and early days, the thing was to do was to conquer the mountains. Yeah, they were all challenges, the rock face, the, the ski slopes. But then slowly I realized it's been in the mountains and moving through the mountains and absorbing the mountains, which is what I preferred rather than the, the conquering and the, and the rushing. And we heard from the uh, a piece of music from one of the intervals with uh, Living Mountain by Nan Shepherd. And that book really affected me. I said, okay, let's talk about going into the mountain. It's mindfulness uh, uh, approach. But yeah, so way back in uh, uh, expat days, um, the two pictures here. My, my, actually, my first project as a site manager, although as a superintendent, was in Boston. And this was a top and out for a pretty standard factory. Uh, but I just love the fact somewhere in, on the outskirts of Boston, there's a beam in a building which has got my signature. And I drew a Union Jack onto that signature. And I, I just love the idea of somewhere in Boston that's happening. The, the two towers you can see on the side there are the, uh, the trade towers in Trinidad and Tobago. That's in Port of Spain. Um, and that was my two years of uh, an expat community. And whereas everyone I was working with would escape to the, the bars, the brothels and the beaches, that was the, uh, the Saturday, Sunday uh, entertainment, I'd escape to the rainforest, to the... Uh, the Northern Territory on Trinidad. This fantastic place called the Asa Wright Centre, and, and Birds of Paradise, absolutely fantastic uh, landscape. And that just reinforced my love of nature, my love of the, uh, of the mountains. Whoops, slides have stopped. Um, back in the UK, my biggest project um, was this one. It was a, a 15 million pound project um, in Lincolnshire. It was a, a distribution centre for Nestle. And I, I'd cringe now to think, yeah, the, the amount of traffic which is, must have come into this building and away from this building. But the, the, the building, the, the section of the building you can see at the back there, at the time was the biggest single store, single unsupported uh, warehouse in, in Europe. But during this uh, project, I realised that project management of big projects wasn't for me and I engineered my way into business improvement. And this really, and I'd recommend this to anyone looking for a change of direction in construction to get into this type of thing. Business improvement, total quality management, system thinking, um, sustainability, at, yeah, the ISO 14000 um, environmental management. And this has st stood me well over the years. The Plan Do Check Act, the, the Deming cycle, I use more or less daily. And you probably recognize the, uh, the, the trick point there, which I've now adopted as my Zoom uh, signal. And uh, Alison's grinning here for a trick point from the, the hill. 
In fact, there's a story here. I was on a, a hill recently and came across a trick point. Wow, it's a trick point I haven't been to before. And I heard the family talking and the little kid, eight, 10 years old, Daddy, what's this? Oh, it's just a lump of concrete. You don't want to worry about that. Sue, my partner, stopped me from interfering and telling it's not a lump of concrete. This is a very significant, and I could have recited the whole history of Trick Point Macon across Britain. So I'm very proud to have a, 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 a Trick Point plaque with my initials on it as a, a member of the, the Benchmark Institute, which I was a, a fellow of for a while. Um, and yeah, then I moved into uh, so social media. Social media, media moved. Twitter, so where are we here? We're back in 2012. Um, and the, the enabled me to, well, it opened so many doors for me. One of the doors that opened was the uh, being able to write a few articles for the, for the Guardian. And I loved discovering these things, it's like a, a drawer when you go back into your, your, your directory. Um, so this is how can social media benefit sustainability initiatives? And that was back in 2012. Uh, the same year we founded B2Camp. This is the, the, the first unconference um, event. And the idea was a group of people would turn up. Half of people wanted to share things, the other half wanted to learn. We'd quickly match the two and end up with a, uh, an unconference. We even had a shop front in Second Life, can you believe that? Where people could drop in and find out about uh, B2Camp. And B2, B2Camp actually stood for Built Environment, Web2. Camp is the format of the unconferences. The lady on the on the left of the screen there, Claire, Claire Bowles, was very instrumental and helped us with B2Camp. She's now based down in Australia um, and she, she was online earlier. The lady on the right, Mel Styers, was also incredibly influential in bringing Living Building Challenge, etc. to the UK. Unfortunately, Mel's no longer with us and greatly missed. Yeah, so uh, Twitter brings the Living Building Challenge to the UK back in 2013 in Architects Journal. And again, it opened in so many doors. And you probably recognize Midge Hall Mill. We did, we did a, um, a living building challenge project with UCLAN. Um, and that led to the, the Curden Valley project, um, which we, we've heard about today, you would have seen the, the video. It took a long time to get it together. And it took a long time with, um, with, with Anna, uh, sorry, with uh, Barbara and others to, to bring it together. Um, another big door opened when someone at one of my conferences came up to me and said, have you thought of writing a book about this? I said, no. Um, and very fortunately, managed to get a, 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 a small advance from Reba to produce Future Restorative, which opened yet more doors. And although written in 27, I'm delighted to go back and think, we were talking about salutogenesis, biophilia, mindfulness, sustainability without barriers, does, you know, does that count for not using the word sustainability? <laughs> and then into Restore, which we've, we've heard about all day, and that's been the, the last four or five years of, uh, of my life in terms of uh, pushing things through. And what, what a fantastic journey is that bit that's been from the work package one all the way through to scale jumping, which we're, we're just concluding. Um, and now working with Carlo in the next, the, the next chapter, really, after Restore, the, the restore is moving towards the uh, moving into the living building, living future your um, camp, which means we will safeguard that for, for, for future generations. Um, so, a real privilege to be the vice president of Living Futures Europe. And along the way, I've worked with so, so many wonderful clients. And I was just thinking, I'd, most of these clients I've, I've worked with, I help them with bids, writing PQQs or ITTs, etc. And it suddenly hit me. I planted little seeds in all these companies all, all over the place about sustainability and regenerative stuff. And you probably recognize a lot of them. Um, and then this happened last April. Um, and I hinted at this, uh, I, I think I'll talk this, this, this morning. Um, we should see the pandemic as a, as a portal. And as we're passing through, we've, we've all been vaccinated. Most of us have been vaccinated now. We're coming out of the portal. What are we gonna leave behind? What are we going to take through? And are we ready to fight for it? And that led to Zoom Regenerative and brings us more or less up to date. But th that's been absolutely wonderful journey of Zoom Regenerative. I've met so many fantastic friends, both virtually and, 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 and in real life. And I'm really grateful to Anna for jumping in to support Zoom Regenerative and the way. 
Uh, but we've uh, a big task in front of us. Um, and I've talked about ego, eco, SIVA on many occasions. But just look at those curves. In the next five years, we need to turn that around. And we're not going to do it with what we've been doing for the last 30 years. We're not going to do it with the e eco mind. It's going to be a completely different mindset. And it's going to need mindfulness, and it's going to need us too, and it's going to need oh, living building challenge. It's going to need a whole set of new tools and approaches. But we can do it. Um, I mentioned Restore 2030, and I was playing around some words earlier enough. The, the phrase came, you know, will you send back a letter from America? You know, the, the pretender song. I couldn't make it fit with 2030. But I wonder what someone in 2030 would be saying about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Um, and this has been a, a theme right through today, hasn't it? About the next generation, inspiring the next generation, listening to the next generation, and enabling them to be bolder than we have been. And then the, the next edition of uh, Zim Regenerative, the uh, Regen Pollinator series, which uh, kicked off on the 4th of May, with three one-hour series on the 4th and the 6th and the 11th, all starting at 7 p.m. Uh, you'll hear much more about this in the near future. The pages are open for registration, and really grateful that a, a number of you have registered already. So thank, thank you for that. And, you know, I'd sit and look at Ferris Night. Um, we've been walking up over Beacon Fell from where these images are taken and from where that photo at the start was taken. And I think about all these generations in, in the past, the farmers, the nomads, the Stone Age, all the way back. And like we've been sharing stories today, they would have sat around their campfires. They would have taken a rest what was out uh, herding and they would have shared stories. And I just wonder what those stories would have been and how they resonate with what we're talking about today. And I bet they didn't use the word sustainability, Anne. <laughs> and, yeah, final slide. If the, the first picture there with a cross is taken from my front room window. So if you speak to me on the phone or on Zoom or anything early in the morning, that's probably what I'm looking for. If you try to phone me at night, I may be in the tent of on Fair Snape or even one of my sort of wooden structures as my version of a cabin in the woods. Um, and then two minutes ago, before, two minutes before I started this, I thought, oh, I haven't mentioned Regen Notes. So I thought I'd better just throw that in to uh, remind people. Regen Notes is a companion to uh, Zoom Regenerative, which is a, uh, a blog post which goes out on a fortnightly basis. And we'll put the link in the, the post. So, and I, I think the bottom line about all this is I've been really grateful for support and friends and things along the way, a number here, here tonight and online. So many thanks. Back to you, Anna. Oh. What a wonderful way to sum up, really. We've just had the best conference. We've had a showcase, a shot window of all this wonderful activity that's been going on for years in the Northwest. And not just the Northwest, but like, as Alison said earlier, Sabden is the centre of the country. So geographically and physically. And then just to hear something like, well, John Rennick and then Martin's presentation. I didn't know the wealth of stuff that these two gentlemen in particular have done and they've, they've shown us this evening. It's not just a little window that we see in this five minutes every fortnight. There's a wealth of stuff. There's a wealth of stuff from my co-presenters here tonight, Alison and, and Anne, that come together and coalesce to put them in the driving seat, really, for all things regenerative, not just in the Northwest, but globally, with a global reach. So my thanks go to everybody on this call tonight and my co-presenters tonight, and for everybody for watching. Thank you. And there might be some questions. Yeah, we, we have 10 minutes left before we close down. So really, I'd like people to unmute and really we can just have a, a conversation. If, if anyone has any questions or comments. Are, are the presentations available? Uh, just remind me, can we actually access them? Yeah, we, we, we can indeed. Um, sorry, I just, just sort of that mute. I'm just going to turn my camera around so you guys can see what's been going on in front of us all day. So I'd, I'd like you to meet. 
<laughs> I'd like you to meet our friends Wayne and Darren, um, who have been recording things and telling us which camera to look at and when to shut up and when to talk. Um, but in the next uh, few days, weeks, etc., we'll start to see some recordings of, of all this, um, and there'll be YouTube versions. Uh, yeah, my, my thanks to, to you two guys. That's, yeah, yeah. I think I can't put my hands on it at the moment, but I know both Nushin and Carlo put questions in the chat boxes earlier along these lines. Nushin, I know Carlo's not with us. Do you want to come in? Can you remember what your question was? I didn't put a question. I know it was a comment. It was actually uh, pretty much the last part of, last slide of my presentation that I put in. It's just, I put it in because it was very relevant to what was being discussed at the time. Um, just another time to say thank you for everything. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conference today with all the contributions and very insightful, all of them. Well, it's such a, a lovely family to be part of. So everybody put your contact details in the chat box to share with each other. I can see some new names tonight and it would be beneficial, I think, for everybody to be in touch. And yeah, the Zoom Regenerative tends to meet every fortnight on a Tuesday evening. We're, we're taking a bit of a break. So the next Zoom Regenerative is on the 18th of May from memory. Um, so that, that will be the, the second s series of 2021. Um, and we've got some great guests lined up to share their insights. I saw someone drop slow ways I into the chat box. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that our first guest back will be Dan Raven Ellison from the slow ways movement. And also you, you may know Dan from the um, National Park Cities approach of which London and maybe Preston. We will get Preston as a national city park. So any other comments? Or have we stunned everyone? I feel stunned here, actually. <laughs> I feel stunned. That presentation on um, water, water courses and salt marshes and yeah, all the coastal things, that blew my mind. That was literally yeah. like, I was listening to it going, whoa, oh my gosh, whoa. Um, <laughs> So, yes, I think it would be amazing yeah. to have a, a longer version. I, I agree, Kate. Th th that's one I've got to watch slowly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree too. We really need to watch that one more time slowly, properly. <laughs> so, so, thank you for that, Richard. And uh, yes, you are online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, many thanks for that. Yeah. And, and Sue, lovely to see you here. If you're still in a position to switch your mic on, I know um, you're working on things at the moment that might be relevant in terms of um, spiritual or Vastu or something like that, but you might not be here. Um, I'm listening, yes, and I've been watching and it's all been brilliant, really fascinating. Um, I especially look, obviously, I loved um, seeing about, you know, this, sort of earth uh, the natural building design that john um presented i'm very keen to read um to read that presenter when it when it becomes available for me um because yes i'm i'm speaking with um it, it's a long time off but we're at the very early stages of 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 helping and working with the navajo, navajo nation in utah and we want to work on nature-based buildings um, with the earth so that's going to be really informative um, information to study and to share and, and maybe there's some conversations around that project in the future for sure but yeah that it's it's all been brilliant I really loved mm. hearing about your work too at the end there Martin and uh, I wanted to ask is you, when you said that you do a blog actually if there's a link to register for that because I'd I'd love to um, to get more information about what you do and on a, on a more regular basis um, yeah, sure. we, we can share that. Uh, Anne's just reached the keyboard. <laughs> so we'll, we'll put something. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, we're on a call on Thursday morning. 
We are, yes. Um, I've just realised my video's not on either. How rude of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean I've got... Um, yes, we are, Martin. So I'm... Um, I, uh, so we talked earlier about uh, the sort of the, the, the cosmic spiritual aspect of design and, and meditation. And uh, yes, I did a, a meditation a while ago, which I've explained to Martin. Um, and I sort of put it out there as how can my uh, talents and skills best benefit um, something else, something for the bigger picture. And uh, I found myself in a Zoom meeting 24 hours later with... Um, Tenzin Rinpoche, uh, Shalpa, who is a Buddhist monk in Nepal, um, who's building the Universal Peace Sanctuary at the birthplace of Buddha, and needs some help. <laughs> um, because the architects that um, were, they were working with, the executive architects on the project, have suffered um, and struggled during COVID and, and they've lost uh, quite a lot of their manpower and Rinpoche needs some help um, completing these um, construction drawings and some of the design detail in order to go to tender on this um, quite incredible project. It's been initially designed by Professor Brunfels who designed the um, parliament buildings in Germany. So it's, it's the, the Universal Peace Sanctuary, I can maybe add a link to it in here. Um, but Martin's kindly agreed to attend this meeting with me on Thursday. We're, we're, we're trying to sort of piece together the puzzle of what's missing so that Rinpoche can, um, can get his drawing package out to tender. So I'm hoping that with Martin's expertise and some of the wider network of, of people and skills that may be even part of this forum, um, once we find out what's needed, that there may be a call to help going out to help Rinpoche complete his peace sanctuary in Nepal, which will be the equivalent of um, um, it, uh, the, uh, well, it's not, it's not a Buddhist center. It's a center for world leaders to get together and discuss and talk about peaceful solutions to world problems. Um, but it's you know it's it's very early stages it's it's quite an ambitious endeavor that um, that Rinpoche has taken upon himself but it's um it's quite an incredible one as well so I I feel like it's been a, a calling to be asked to come and help with this project I think that many aspects of it are going to be beyond my personal skill sets but the, the skills that I can bring to the table I will be so um, and maybe once Martin's attended this meeting and we know what's needed that can be something we can discuss at future Absolutely. meetings. And that's the purpose of going along to the meeting just to observe and then bring back the, the plea for help to the Zoom Regenerative yeah. Yes um, and, and, and I think there's lots of um, there's lots of what I've he heard here today. I couldn't get here earlier today. Unfortunately, I'm, I was working um, and in meetings and, and on site. And, uh, so I, I could only get to the evening part of this. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of the earlier stuff might be available because uh, you've recorded it for me to watch um, retrospectively. But thank you um, for inviting me to this and, uh, and yeah. it's been fascinating. Uh, th thank you. So good to have you part of the, uh, the community. Yeah, it's good. So we, we said we'd wind up at nine, nine o'clock. Um, any, any final comments or questions from anyone? Uh, Anne's just dropped the Regen Notes link into chat. So thanks. Thanks, Anna. No problem. I think we do have one from Kate, if Richard wanted to take it, but it might take us well past nine o'clock. I don't know. What do you think, Richard? Okay, do you want to come off on mute? Yeah, I was just, I, I don't, is Richard still here? Um, I was just trying to interpret all that information we got given by Richard because he was the presentation I think was titled Landscape Scale Climate Adaptation. So talking about how, you know, how do we adapt to the fact that the sea level is going to rise? Does it also offer like a mitigation solution? Because it also it is the blue, sorry, there was so much information. There's this blue carbon solution where obviously then that's a better biodiverse habitat that can absorb emissions. Yeah, yeah there is med mitigation with the uh, salt marshes. They do sequester carbon. So that is on, the, on, that, on that particular aspect of the, of the talk. 
yeah, it is very relevant for that. Um, and also uh, green infrastructure is just so important for, you know, air quality. Um, and uh, it's, you can use it integrated with buildings so you can cool the building with using green roofs and, uh, and vertical walls. And that was an example in the um, that, that picture of that, that planning application that was approved five weeks ago in Swansea. That is just best practice stuff. Um, and what I just, I, I did want to just try to get across was um, we know all this stuff. It's the only thing that's stopping us doing, getting on with stuff is the politics. It's the impedance of the politics. We know how to do all this stuff. We need to build our capacity, but we need to actually make sure more, as many people as possible understand what the problem is and what the solutions are and have a have a talk about it, an intergenerational talk about this, but it's, it's vitally important for the younger generation because I just worry so much about this stuff coming down the track and they're increasingly aware of it and they need to be armed with, well, we should be doing this, that and the other. And that's, that's the thing. Thank you. I think that might be a good place to leave it. Yeah, there, there was just any other questions. I've put a document that attract, uh, um, gosh, I can't get my words out now, that addresses everything that you and Richard have just spoken about, Kate. So have a look at that from Natural England this morning. Go on, Martin. I talked all over you then. No, 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 I was just going to share something. I, I've just received an email to say I had a letter published in the Independent today um, on the CE bill. That's the uh, Climate and Ecology Emergency Bill. Um, so I just asked people to sign up to, to that. I'll, I'll find the link and share that in a moment. Alison, yeah, I totally agree. We, we could do some short, child friendly, animal friendly. <laughs> Uh, videos for the COP cha challenge. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Yeah. Super. I found the link. And we've got Darren showing us the uh, t time to cut and wrap and all the things. So I, I think that brings to today's uh, proceedings to a close. And actually, proceedings is a good word because we, we, we will be producing a book of proceedings. Uh, it'll be a, a short downloadable PDF, uh, hopefully one page or so for each of the key speakers who've been talking today. So we'll be back in touch with you if you've done a Petra Kucha or if you've done a major uh, presentation earlier during the day. So for, from me, it's a huge thank you. And uh, yeah, and, and thank you to my, my, my co-host here. It's, it's been a wonderful day, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we'll see everybody in a fortnight. Yep. Indeed, well, we'll see everybody on the on the, <laughs> on yeah. the uh, po pollinator tutorials. We will. Yeah. Pollinator and, tutorials. And then back properly in a fortnight. That's wonderful. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And for those yeah. of you who are an hour ahead, thank you very much for spending the time.